Good evening, everybody. You are here for the Ask an Expert reunion tour with Christine Shree and me, Eric Campbell. And we're here to answer your questions, talk a little shop, and uh, just hash over the rules of the day. Now, it has been a rough time, folks, so be prepared for a little bit of loose discussion. Hey, everybody. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Christine. Happy to have you on with me today. And especially with everything going on, we already have a few people checking in. So I'm going to drop these in. Uh, hello, Wade. Thank you for showing up. And we have Jeff. Jeff, awesome. Good to see you here. Uh, Great from for, being, M -Nerd. for being here, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, Heidi, <laughs> hello, Wonder Woman and Batman. We may have ah, to explain that seen, one. Uh, she's seen Todd's post, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Todd Todd glossed me Batman earlier because I, I came on and talked about uh, e-commerce for a while and nobody really knew I did anything outside of embroidery, which I can't really blame anybody for. But he's like, oh, yeah, you're Batman at night with the e-commerce. So, yeah. Uh, there you go. And then you got the Wonder Woman gloss, I believe, on two regular guys, if I remember right. Uh, yeah. Comments. I think somebody called <laughs> me Batman and I said, what does that make me, Robin? And Todd yeah. chimed in and said, no, you're Wonder, Wonder Woman. Woman. And I was well, like, I like that much, much better. <laughs> much better. So everybody watch out for the truth lasso. I will try not yeah. to uh, cuss when I tell the truth, but sometimes I do. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, we're people. in the same boat there, so <laughs> we'll both have to behave. Right. Justin says, hello. Hi, Justin. Michael Dunny. How hey, hey. Wow. Hey, Mike. Todd hey, hey, is hey. on. Jan um, is on. Wow. Keith. And Kim, hi, E. Rich. Mm, no, everywhere you know, I go. We gotta kill that. <laughs> everywhere I go. Kim. I know. We really gotta kill that. Uh, and hi, Christine from Kim also. Thank hi, you. Kim. Penny is here. Todd, there we go. Glad <laughs> Christine didn't have to kill the internet. Why was I going to kill the internet? Oh, is that from <laughs> that must be from last Friday when I couldn't get on? Oh, yeah, that's right. This is true. And that yeah, was, I was so mad. Oh. <laughs> For sure. I can, I can uh, you know, commiserate there because having done a lot of live shows when the internet just won't yeah. behave, it is not fun at all. And we have well, Nida on. Great job. Hi, Nadia. Nida's on there. Uh, Renee is there. And we have Sheila. Oh, wow. wow. Everybody's yeah. here. Bobby Ray. Tanya's here. Okay. I could do this the entire time we're here and Ooh, that'd be fun for me. Let's just for an hour. Let's just, let's just give shout outs that. to everybody and make everybody feel good, right? Let's just say everybody's <laughs> name on the air. That's the way to do it. Uh, but I guess we'll, we will move on to other stuff. What I will say is everybody jump in on those comments and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Um, we absolutely have, okay, Christine knows marketing and e-commerce. And also she, as you know, works for Enmart. So she's got supplies knowledge. She has that kind of knowledge too. I have got lots of embroidery knowledge and uh, a bit of e-commerce here and there. Uh, so honestly, we know lots of stuff that we could talk about for you. But if not, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. We've been doing a lot of stuff for a long time, more than I really want to admit. So, you know, uh, I looked at, I actually was cleaning my office and I yeah. found some old Stitches magazines from, you don't even want to know how long ago. Oh, I, I probably I mean, don't. I probably like, don't. Like a billion years ago. I was, can't remember how, what it was that we started writing together, but it's been a long time. I mean, I've been blogging um, for them 2006, 14 years ago. 2009, 2010. Sounds about right. Sounds the about blog right. started... I had a memory pop up a little bit ago where I said, oh, I just got asked to write a blog for Stitches. And that yeah. was, I'm trying to remember, but I want to say that was 2012, 2011, maybe. I don't even remember. I believe anymore. it. I believe it. Because I, I started 2006 after winning the Gold Needle Awards. They kind of asked me to jump yeah, on and do uh, teaching on that. And that's how that started. Oh, by the way, let's get a couple other people in here because I see... Alan Howe, e Erich, hit me at Erich again. But Alan says, I have screen print questions. If you have screen print questions, we're going to ask Alan Howe. Because <laughs> <laughs> he knows all the screen print stuff. So I'll put you on the spot if you ask so any what? screen print questions. So Alan is saying there should have been a trio. Is that what he's saying? It is right now. Alan's here. <laughs> and there we have Lisa Shaw spring cleaning. Lots of good info there. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. All right. So and Joe Rita, thank you for showing up, Joe Rita. Happy to have you here. And Cindy, who's there at, like every show, how you listen to us all the time. I don't know, Cindy, but got the chicken in the That's oven. The and now I'm here. here. Well, the chicken in the oven is chicken important. Chicken in my place because I need some dinner tonight. So. Yeah, right. I'll be running home and making dinner here shortly. But what I'm going to bring yeah. up, since we we called this the Ask an Expert Tour. Oh, Jeff says, when do I go live? I will hold you to that. I will hmm. hold you to that, Jeff, because I think you should. And also we have uh, 
Alan, sorry, off duty, LOL. You're going to be oh, on, no, I believe, tomorrow. Hilarious. Wait till I show up and ask you embroidery questions in your life. All right. And then Brian's, Brian Bailey, of course, uh, creator of Embrilliance and who allows me to bring all this awesome stuff to you, including the little studio here. By the way, green screen is God. We had some, the internet's being real fun right now. So I had to pull the green screen to keep uh, in sync, but everything was good. Yeah. But yes, uh, Haya Embridge, <laughs> pronounce Mr. Brick. There we go. Hi, I Christine. Is that an inside joke of some kind that I'm not getting? <laughs> we're trying. We're trying to. Everybody either loves E. Rich or wants it gone. That's the oh, way to do I'm it. Not, I'm in the wants it gone camp. If yeah, it's it's hard vote. to go. It's hard to go. No, uh, I did but it I wrong. I've known you a long time. So yeah, no, no, no. And then we have a. Uh, if we have uh, Matt come on for Vinyl and Rhinestones, we could, right? Embrick. There we go. There we M go. Embrick. That that works. I mean, I am built like a brick something or other. Uh, so there we go. <laughs> so I'm there not, we go. I tried I, I not to curse. I can't. I tried not to curse. Because every response I can think of to that <laughs> is just going to get me in so much trouble. We're here so for I'm trouble, people. <laughs> We're here for I'm trouble. I'm not doing it, but I'm thinking it. <laughs> no one can stop what you think, people. No one can see in my head. Yes, in brilliance. We are in brilliant here. This is the truth. We trend. are in brilliant. Absolutely. So what I am going to bring up here, though, guys. Oh, wow. Oh, That's okay. Old home that. day. So this is the thing. Blast from the past. This is 2013, which is actually not when we started. We were already quite a ways into it, but we did this. But yep. what I wanted to show people, we talked about this before. It's like, oh, yeah, we used to do uh, Ask an Expert. So what are we talking about? Stitches Magazine, which was just an awesome magazine at the time. I really loved working with Stitches. It gave both of us our start, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this is for me, I started, like I said, I started with contests and then we started writing. And I don't know how you started. They just asked you um, after a contribution. Nicole, or? I think Nicole Rollander, who was hmm. the editor of Stitches when we worked there, she reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to write something. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And at that point, I didn't really even know that I could do that. I mean, I knew I could write, I didn't really know that I could consistently and look yeah. at how much, good lord look at how many words i've written now <laughs> well then if you guys don't know you have to go check out the the blogs that nmart runs you know those blogs that's that's christine's work guys so all of the mm -hmm. all the stuff that's on both of the blogs that are our primary for there those are always being you know you those are resources you should go back to so christine yeah. also i used to love the roundups i remember that's a lot of the time back when i was yeah, first blogging I, you did the roundups the weekly roundups great i still try to do those the blogs for yeah. those of you that don't know threadjucate yes and, stuff. and stuff .com. And we, I used to do a Friday blog roundup where i would just go around and collect various pieces of information and articles and things that I thought were interesting. And Eric featured frequently mm -hmm. um, for one thing or another, but those were fun to do. I haven't been writing as much on the blogs as I would like to lately, just because yeah. of everything else that's been going on. True. But <laughs> yeah. things do happen. Absolutely. You guys should check it out. And I will agree. Uh, like grab a couple more comments. Christina is a rock star. I agree. Thank Christina you, Lisa. Is a rock star. Thank you, Lisa. Brian, who's pointing out that I'm in the Embrilliance offices right now, says, uh, there's beer in the fridge if you need it, Eric. I will remember that. <laughs> I'm trying to keep the uh, the beer off of my waist right now, so I haven't had uh, a lot of that, but, you know, we'll, we'll I see. I have now. our cider in my fridge if anybody's interested. There you go. And we have a real question, but before we get there, I'm actually going Ooh. to take one second and uh, roll down to – you go through the the wonder that was 2013 in the magazine. But the thing is, Ask an Expert used to be placed right before the end of the magazine. It was yep, the last it was page. The last little bit. The at last the end little page the before the ads. Here's all the ads. And then you would have, well, there's there's some other stuff. But we have uh, Ask an Expert was there too. And I think, did I just run right past I it? I think you went past it somehow. Uh, maybe we all have, guys. There we go. Oh, there you go. This was Ask an Expert. And what we used to do is that uh, month to month, uh, Christine and I would trade off uh, yep. what we were talking about. And actually this one is Christine's and I, I guess I put her on the spot. I honestly, it's because it's all I could find at first because I, I realized fine. I didn't have my PDFs on this one, but this is actually one of Christine's articles. And it was, uh, I want to revamp my marketing plan for 2014. So anybody who wants to get on your 2014 marketing plan, you might want to, <laughs> you, might, you be go, a I, might be a little late. I never gave you anything, but there is something on here that's actually quite great. And I love this, uh, because we do have, uh, it talks about, the article talks about, Christine talks about, 
Working to increase your social media community is still good, but here's one that we should talk about right now. Uh, don't capitalize on a tragedy or current events to make a sale. Oh, um, still believe that's true. Still believe that's true. And I think that um, there's nothing wrong with people tapping into whatever is feeling right now. I think that people want right. to represent themselves. Um, this is this, if I remember right, this is right when the first kind of marketing on event shirts were going on that kind of news jacking was the term at the time, yeah. I believe where something would come out big in the news and then someone would immediately jump out and start making garments for it. But sometimes it really was, it came off in a way that was like, all right, predatory, you know? Yeah. Well, so I think not that's, even, it's not even the making the shirts always too. It's just businesses in the industry that, come at what they're trying maybe their intent is good or what they're trying to say is benign but the way that they say it i've seen yeah. a couple businesses and i'm not going to name anybody but i've seen a few that are kind of like well you have all this extra time right now so you should buy an embroidery machine and i'm like you know i get what you're trying to say but no <laughs> well and i think i think the thing is that in general everybody has to really think about uh, taking care of each other right now yeah. and uh, doing what's right. In fact, that was a great thing today uh, without re revealing anything internal about our about every company that we work for here. But um, I know we had a discussion about that. Lisa and Ryan and I have been discussing that. It's like, what can, what can everybody do to give back? What can everybody yeah. do now to do something that's, uh, yes, is relevant to what's going on right now right. with COVID? What's going on with everybody under quarantine, with everything going on that makes right. a small business hard to do? What can we do to help that? But that's the thing. If you come from the attitude of what can we do to help that? What can we do to make people feel better? There's nothing wrong with it being tied to your business. There is something wrong with profiteering and that kind of stuff. And I think nobody here, nobody who's in this group of people, the awesome people I see here uh, feels that way. And I think that's the thing. I'm not concerned about anybody here, but it is something to remember just to be careful when you're firing off those social media blasts or whatever mm -hmm. it is, especially if you're on your business pages. I, I'll say this is my, my addendum to this is that I haven't seen anybody in our community profiteering. I have seen people sometimes firing off some stuff you want to be careful about. Um, be, be, you know, think about who's listening and, and uh, be in good spirits when you start. Um, it's just one of those things where either panic or upset or finger pointing or all that stuff. Some of that is just not for the business page, keep it for the private page. Um, it's not that you can't have an opinion, but I do think that sometimes you have to be careful where you well, are. Well, I'm going to differ with this just a little bit. Sure. And I agree with you in theory, but I also think you have to think about who's paying attention to what you're saying too, sure. Sure. even on your exactly. personal page. True. I mean, I have seen some people that I would consider for better or worse leaders in this industry hmm. who have put some things up that I was like, oh, dude, just don't. There are people who who pay attention to what you say and who are looking to you for mm -hmm. information and what to think. And even if it's your personal page and you think nobody's ever going to see it, I saw it. Yeah, no, I, I'll you agree know. there much. as much as that uh, if we all start. Yeah. And here's Arlette comes up and says this and I'll agree with this here is that you need to know your audience. So, yeah, exactly. know your audience and and maintain the kind of, you know, like I said, if you're starting out with in your heart, the whole feeling is I want to help my industry, my community, right. the people around me um, stay on that positive tack. A lot of you guys are already out there doing it, but I'd like to see that continue. But yeah, so, well, you know. And I think also just and I say this when I do seminars on social media too. just be aware if you're connected to the business, if you're the owner, if you're a face, if people yeah. see you and they connect your name with like me with Enmart, people see me, they go, oh, Enmart. I'm like, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. OK, but I'm always aware of that. Even sure. when I'm off being something that has nothing to do with Enmart, I'm always aware of that because I don't know who's going to see what I post or what I do, you know? So I, I think you need to err on the side of caution. That's my sure. perspective on that. For sure. And I will say this, uh, we've had some good stuff coming out of this and Alan brings this up. Uh, uh, Allie Banholzer has talked a lot about things that she's gone through and talking about her checklist for, mm -hmm. you know, for situations like this. And Alan says he's updating his checklist. So yeah. Um, absolutely. And Jeff, you're right. Once it's on the internet, it's there forever. So yeah, it is. Using it is. 
But what I think I'll do, let's let's jump in real quick on a question. And this is like where I may not have all the answers, but we'll see. It's uh, Jeff actually brings up a question about needles. And I'm going to bring us back to the forefront here and take us. Okay. Uh, on selecting needles, what do you use to determine if you're going to drop down to a 68 or up to 116? Let's go on a typical fabric like a polo. And does thread weight have an influence on the physical thickness of thread? And actually, by the way, I owe you an email, Jeff, because we have to talk about, we talked about some things about measurements and thread weight. Um, but what I'll say is this, honestly, when I go up and down with needles is really all about the thread. Um, if the thread is thicker, I'm going to go up in the needle gauge generally because I want to have a bigger hole, have less, um, less abrasion, less friction, less tension on it. And honestly, when I look at thread companies, most of them, if they have thicker and thinner threads are going to give you a needle gauge that they say is ideal or is recommended. Those are a good place to start. If you're going down 68 thread, go down to a smaller needle. Uh, most, but I'll be honest here with you here. There are the things we do that we prescribe and then there are the things that actually happen in production. And one of the things that actually happens in production for uh, for the shops I've worked at is that frequently it's a 7511 transitional kind of medium ballpoint needle and it gets used on everything, whether it's the best needle or not. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't have, and I'm not talking about a major thick ballpoint, I'm talking about the transitional kind of, it's not really a ballpoint, it's the transitional uh geometry where it's not quite a sharp, not quite a ball. Um, that needle will do a lot of work and look pretty good. It's not that you should use it for certainly on like 68 thread, 75 weight thread, I wouldn't. But um, for most things, I'm going to be honest and say I didn't always switch to sharps or to or back and forth depending on what I was running. Um, but ideal cases, ideal situations, uh, I'm going to go with the recommendations thread companies have are usually pretty right on. I'm going to go up to a thicker needle. The only other time I'll go up to a bigger needle every once in a while is when you're having deflection problems on things like a hat that has a really thick seam. Sometimes a deflection, a stouter needle or a needle that has geometry that has a shorter shank or a shorter blade. Um, I can't remember the gross Beckert needle code right now off the top of my head. That's all I used were needles that had that shorter uh, the shorter gauge generally. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's so that they don't deflect as much or break on hats. But that's 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 where I usually do needle selection. For me, needle size is about the thread, absolutely. And then um, and needle point geometry, like I said, weren't always switching them. But when we were, it was about the fabric underneath. And that also goes to uh, people will say, okay, well I'm running on this, but I have a topping that's this. The garment fabric is usually what I'm going to cater to with the needle. So that's that's how it goes to me. So needle point geometry, the fabric, needle size, and uh, the eye is really all about the thread. So there we go. So there's a highly technical question from Jeff. If you guys were there you stuff, then, then there you go. It is good. Questions, please, please jump in. But yeah, I, yeah, I think that's that's right. It's like, this is the right one, I believe. The DB, DBXK or DBXK1, I believe that's the right needle I'm talking about that has that kind mm. of scout geometry for the caps. Uh, but yeah, and there we go. Lisa Shaw, yes, needle size is about the thread. Absolutely. It well, is. there you go. You've been validated now. So yes, I, I have Lisa on my side, so I'll be good. Uh -huh. So, okay, let's see. This would be funny. Uh, Mike says, uh, can you think of anything you get asked over and over again that you politely answer a wish embroiderers would quit fixating on? Because in actual practice, it doesn't really matter. Needle angles, thread tensions, pressure foot adjustments, etc." I mean, I don't think it just has to be technical stuff because I know, Christine, you probably get in marketing. So you probably have some of these things. Well, too. embroidery, too. One of the things we get asked a lot, which I wish would go away really, really hard, um, is why do you have all these backings? All I ever use is just one. I use a medium weight cutaway for everything and it works great and I never have any problems. And why do you have all these expensive specialty backings? And I wish that one would go away and I'm doing my best to try to educate that away <laughs> as much as I can. But um, so that's my, I guess my embroidery related question. The other one is at trade shows is all this booth down here yours. That one <laughs> is too. Yeah, it is. Yeah, all yeah, the is. Mark signs are, you know, we've got like 50 Enmart signs in the booth and people will go, is exactly. that guy down there with you? I'm like, yeah, he is. Uh, yeah, and I'll say for me, some of the ones that get me the most, and I'll bring the question back up again. Uh, but again, the, the things that embroiderers fixate on, and, but in actual practice, doesn't matter as much. Um, it's not that they don't matter; it's that they're, the question's not the correct question to ask. Mm -hmm. One of the ones I get is, and, and this is machines, software, materials. Um, which X machines, software, thread, whatever, will make my design look the best? 
Mm. All right. Well, with digitizing, I have used every software under the sun. I have made masterpieces and trash in every one of those pieces of software. Right, right. Someone do it too. Um, most softwares have the basic tools you need and and really it's the automation that speeds you up that softwares have and not all software has the same automation. I mean, and like working in a brilliance, we have like a, an automated foam setting that I haven't seen anywhere ever. It puts in the caps and the bridges. So that means foam would be faster there. But you know, I mean, any tool you have will have certain things that are good about it, but they make you faster at a certain thing. They don't make it better. And also threads. I love different thread companies. And I know it's bad because everybody goes, oh, well, you're a Madeira person. I, go, I use a lot of Madeira. It's what I came up on and I really love their stuff and I've done some work with them, but I've used Iris from Enmart. I like mm -hmm. that very much. I did. I've got a lot of really great pieces in the Iris Metallic. Um, and I've used everything. I mean, what did we run in our shop? A lot of it was uh, Isocord and I've done no work for Ackerman. I've done no, you know, partnerships or anything with them. And they, in fact, the funny thing is they came up to me and said, oh, we didn't approach you because we thought you were a Madeira person. And I go, you know, I love Madeira. I love their stuff, but I love Iris stuff. I love, I mean, I, I like thread. If you look at my thread collection, oh yeah, it's everybody. I hate to say it. Everybody gets represented in my thread collection because I use <laughs> is and I use what I, I, I need. Um, and honestly, when it comes down to digitizing, um, yeah, price alone will not make your digitizing better. The interpretation is in the eye of the digitizer. It has nothing. I wouldn't say nothing. It's not a quality has nothing to do with your software, but uh, the interpretation going from art to a three-dimensional thing, a two-dimensional thing to a three-dimensional thing is in, in the head of the embroider and also the uh, the technical nature of it too. So let me bring a couple of things in here too. Uh, Jeff says, uh, you can hammer a nail with any hammer, but you need the knowledge to swing it. Yeah, no, it's why is the question, you know, uh, right. why would you make something to this shape? Not how the, how is fairly easy. The button pushing you can do the mm -hmm. why is harder. Alan, how garbage in garbage out. Yeah. A bad True. digitizer will make that work on any, any software and vice versa. But yeah, that's how that works. And Mike says, great answers. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> great question, Mike. We didn't Woo! have one. I, I think the other technical thing I would I would say for that is that um, it's not that it, it's something that I find annoying and it has to go away, but that uh, when I talk about 3D foam, 3D foam is a finicky darn thing. And the joke I always tell, and it is, it's an old joke, but I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, you can ask three digitizers how to do 3D foam. They'll give you five answers and at least two of them work. Uh, right. There are certain topics, small lettering, like little tiny lettering, 3D foam, that there's more than one way to skin a cat. I hate to use that one, but there's more than way to way to get it done. There are multiple effective ways to get it done. A lot of it is, pro, is you know, subjective. I have a way mm -hmm. I like to do it. We have a, a way we like to do it here at the shop, but that's, yeah, that's how it is. Um, it's one of those things that you can do right. multiple ways. Well, I'm gonna throw out one marketing one. Oh, right on. I, this is one that is a real pet peeve of mine because I think it's a very pervasive um, misconception in the marketing world. And that's if you're on social media, it's about how many people are following you and not about who's following you. Yes. And I coined, I don't know if I coined the term, but I use it quite a bit. I call it strategic following. And what I'm talking about is you know who your market is, you know who you want to reach, and you follow those people, and you don't like your family, and you don't ask your brother's cousin's friend to like your page, so you'll have more people, unless your brother's cousin's friend wants whatever it is you have to sell. And this is, I mean, even the social media companies themselves will do it. They'll put up these ads where they go, more fans equals more business. And it's like, no, it's the right fans that equals more business. You can have 10,000 people that like your site. And if 9,999 of them don't care about what you're selling, then you don't have anything. You have to be talking to the right people. And I think that's one thing that needs to be taught a lot more than it is. Quality versus quantity, exactly, Ramona. No, and I say that all the time. Probably it's boring now because I say it a lot when I talk about social media because true. It's, it's just, I think it's the biggest thing that people think they're doing right that they're doing wrong when it comes to, to using their social media to publicize their business. 
I would have to fully agree with that. I, I'm on board because it, the right hundred people beats the wrong 10,000 all day long. Oh, yeah, Why exactly. About, I mean, when you hear influencers now, what you hear is someone who has a ton of followers, right? You right. That, but and, and that's what we mean to make it. But here's the thing. Influencers, when you're talking about multi-level where you're like, OK, this person themselves they have a network of people who are listening, who are actually in my market. That's a real influencer. And that's somebody you want. By well, far. in the other half of that, sorry, not to interrupt, but I that's wanted to make this point too. The other half of influencers is anyone can call themselves an influencer. You have to go and look and see, can they actually get the people in who are following them to do something? Because if they go, I'm an influencer and I have, you know, 15,000 followers and then they put up your product and none of those followers care or want to buy it, then they're not an influencer. They're just a person with a heck of a lot of followers. Oh, I so, see. And that's, that's a due diligence thing before you pay anybody money. And I think influencers are overblown, honestly, speaking as someone who probably could be considered an influencer in some situations even. But I really think it's an overblown advertising method. It's kind of the fashionable buzzword thing right now. There's a lot of work you need to do first before an influencer is going to do you any good. Oh, yeah. Well, and people aren't always even set up for it. And actually, Lisa has a good a good follow-up question. We have a couple of great marketing questions here. Let's bring Lisa's on. Uh, how many platforms should you market on? As many as your customers are on. Exactly. I was going to be like, I would say it's a good question, but the wrong question. And not because Lisa's wrong yeah. about it, but it's a question that everybody asks. They say, well, where should we, how do I have to be yeah. everywhere? It depends. Where's no. your customer? No, you don't. Uh, I mean, I always tell people, I'm like, if you really don't know, Facebook's not a bad bet because of the volume of people who are on it. But right. especially if you were, let's say right now, if I profile someone and say, okay, you are a streetwear brand. Your people are 16 to 25 is your main They're demographic. Not They're not on Facebook. No. Maybe Instagram, definitely TikTok. Yeah. Probably a good idea to get out there and start doing that. And by the way, having seen what, um, speaking of Matt Vassallo from the Rhinestone World, seeing what he's doing with TikTok and how many of his posts have gone viral. And I hate to use that word in the particular context of the time, mm -hmm. but seeing how many of his posts have taken off TikTok does have some room to grow. It is it, we're in that era where the um, where the organic reach is still there in the in that market. Well, that's one of the first things that's yeah. I guess it is one of the first things that I tell people when they ask me these kind of questions is, well, who's your market? And it yeah. astonishes me how many people can't say or yeah. don't really know or haven't really thought about it. Oh, yeah, they, and they just I, really and, I, and my follow up story is, well, how can you figure out where you're supposed to be if you don't know who you want to talk to? Well, and it could I mean, also be instead of, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, on, on the back end, it's not even just, um, it doesn't have to be who's already buying from you. It can also be who you're reaching out to. I mean, yeah, you have exactly. to have a drive because sometimes people say, well, I don't really know my people yet. I'm like, well, definitely, you know, collect information from them and find out who they are. Mm -hmm. But if you're reaching to a new market, then you have to know more about them and, and get some sort of attitude there. You have to understand. Well, you have to have a target. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, even if you don't know your people yet or you haven't made a lot of sales, you have to have something to aim for. Maybe once you aim for it, you'll realize it's not where you should have been aiming, but oh, yeah. you have to have a place to start. And that's, you know, people, people who are just like throwing arrows widely or darts or whatever the metaphor mm -hmm. is that you want to make at that particular point, you're, you're not really accomplishing what you want to accomplish. So oh, I don't totally. know. I, I'm really thinking about doing some marketing stuff. So we'll I think that'd be a good idea. I would like to hear more about that. Christine well, Free Consulting. There you go. There you go. Baby. There you go. <laughs> it's coming. Well, you'd be lucky I'm not Aaron where I don't say what date will you have your first? Because <laughs> Aaron did that to me, which is why like not this coming Saturday, but the Saturday after I have a big I webinar. I know you're I've doing your webinar which is going uh, to be very exciting. We shall see. No, <laughs> you're let me, let me, no. Let me put comments up and hide from that. Uh, Todd Downing says, uh, we have different types of customers at different platforms. Absolutely. I would have sure. to agree on that one. And I would agree with that too. There are people there. Absolutely. But um, the good thing about that comment that I really love is he yeah. knows that. Yeah. He's aware enough and he's paid attention enough that he knows 
his customers on this platform will respond to this stuff. And it's so kudos to you, Todd. Well, I like you using it now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Je Je not just the gloss. Now I'm going to bring one up from Jeff, Jeff and, and address this. Uh, in marketing, uh, would there ever be a time which you would utilize the supplies you use as part of a marketing campaign, not a garment brand, but let's say you're using body real foam or other specialty items. I'm going to say no. Because this yeah, is I, uh, the only way that works really is if your customer base understands what that means. And generally really? the people that you're selling to don't have the industry knowledge to understand why it matters if you're using bodybuilder foam or, you know, action back backing, which granted isn't our backing, but we have the same stuff. We just call it a different thing. Sure. Um, sure. You know, and I, so I think if you're talking to a particular technical audience, if you were marketing something to other embroiderers, maybe who would understand it, then yeah, it's kind of a selling point maybe, but to the general public, not, I would say not really as much because it's not going to have any significance for them. It might well, sound yeah. cool, yeah, but it's not going to have the resonance that it would for people who are in the industry and understand whatever the item is. Well, That's and frankly, I think you have these you have these levels of separation because some people really don't want to know how the sausage is made for sure. Well, there's, and I'll say there's that too. Certainly, as a contract decorator, maybe you could do that, especially if someone has come to you and you the, the concept is you are the higher quality decorator. Mm -hmm. Maybe you say I use quality materials. That could be a thing. But usually, when we're talking about business to business or business to customer, what I find is not only are they not really buying a shirt mm -hmm. or a hat they are buying the experience they will have or what it means about them <laughs> when they buy it. So it's like, if I'm buying a, a family reunion shirt, maybe I care a little about the quality. What do I actually want? I'm buying the recognition from my family that I did a good job. I'm buying the feeling of togetherness I think we'll have when we all take our shirts and put them on and take our family picture. I'm buying the results of the garment. So I'm not even buying the garment. So not only am I not buying the decoration and I'm not buying the garment, I'm buying the feeling I get or what someone will think of me because I bought it. Um, or the memory. Or the memory itself. Well. Yeah. The results are the, the end. When you're talking about selling or marketing, I feel like it's, you're really trying to sell the results. I would much mm -hmm. rather sell to someone the feeling you get when you hand somebody the gift than, you know, <laughs> than, than what it was before. So any case, so there it is. Well, I would, uh, I mean, I think that's very true. And it's funny because you can spend a lot of time mulling over all the various benefits of whatever yeah. it is. And then something really stupid will be the, will be the thing that really clicks with people. We mm -hmm. have a, a cotton quilting thread that NMR yes. sells. Yeah. The one thing that people say, and we've come up with, you know, it's your heirloom and it's your memories and it's a great cotton quilting thread and all this stuff. We came up with this beautiful marketing program, blah, blah, blah. The one thing they tell us more than anything, it doesn't yeah. make a lot of lint. So it's now the no hint of lint thread yeah. and that sells it. But that's also, you You saw that from your customer and your customer, of course, is us. So yeah, we care about that. What's our experience? We tired of cleaning our machine. Like that's, <laughs> so of course that's our experience with it. Well, yeah. And it, it was a silly little thing that we were like, yeah, it's probably not anything. And that's probably the number one thing we get told. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and actually I've got a couple comments here that are pretty good. Uh, by the way, sorry, Jennifer, she says it's not the Q and A she asked for. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes we get on marketing or something else. We have, we have a wide strike zone, but here's a couple of things I want to bring up here. Uh, Carolyn says, uh, my retail doesn't care about my skill showing. They want to see my creativity. Very yeah, true. Quite Very frankly. True. But then there are times when it does matter. Uh, Todd brings up, I love all made shirts. My customers have no clue what they are and don't care. So we need to educate them when they are. Uh, yeah, because yeah. all made is a brand that has a purpose behind it. That is actually, you know, it has a charitable purpose. Then sometimes when you're talking about purpose marketing, something like that, where there is a difference, um, mm -hmm. educating on that can be a way to get uh, you know, traction with it. So, and they do well, cost more. Yeah, there's sure. a difference between I'm using this because it's cool and I'm using this or I think it's cool or what it does is cool, which isn't yeah. probably going to matter to the end user. And mm -hmm. I'm using this because there's a story behind it or there's a purpose behind it that I can get behind. And I think you will, too. Yeah. And it's all about how you tell the story. And really, that's that's really all marketers are. 
honestly, and I'm I'm giving away trade secrets here, but we're really just storytellers. Yeah, That's totally. kind of how it works. Well, and honestly, you do have to show people but either the benefits or the actual item itself. And actually I'll bring that on there. Yeah. You have to tell, sell the story of the product, like all made definitely with yeah. there, Alan and Brian brings up, uh, we made posters and hung samples by the posters to let people know about them. My wife wrote an article for our website. Absolutely. Uh, tell yeah. the story and show your work. One of the things that I've actually had to come in on funny enough on the marketing side for, for decorators is that some people will come in and show their most difficult work all the time. And I, right. I'm, I'm definitely with somebody who's done this. You show your most difficult, colorful, crazy work that was the hardest to do, took the longest to do because it's impressive to us. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that means you have non-profitable craft project work coming in that you would have rather had something else a little more, you know, uh, in your strike zone for profit. So you show, you need to make sure you're showing a wide range of work. It's cool to show your skill, but if all you show is that, you might either be in unapproachable or right. you might be constantly getting that kind of work. And we found that, uh, especially at like Black Duck, where I, I was uh, you know, commercially digitizing, we sometimes were showing work that was not only not profitable, it was really difficult for us to do and didn't fit in. And so what kind of work did people want us to do? unprofitable, difficult work. Right. Now, some of that panned out and sometimes we worked on our pricing to make that work. Right. But there were times where it's like, you have to show other stuff there. So yeah, absolutely. You have to do that. Well, and you have to remember too, that you're, you know, most of your customers that come in are going to be looking for the two color shirt. Okay. That's green printing, but, or the left chest design on their polos for their landscaping company or whatever it is. Yeah. So you have to have examples of that available too. Um, because they don't know, they, they don't really, un, they don't really know always what no. they're looking for. So if everything you have is really elaborate, then they get on the really elaborate bus and I want this really cool, awesome thing that they don't want to pay for and they don't really need. Yeah, no doubt. That's, so that is absolutely one of the problems. Don't do that. Well, and that's like Todd says, uh, one of the reasons I show a lot of single and two color jobs. Uh, absolutely. Go. And then this Katie, I agree with this when you're talking about what she's calling wow items, Katie, who teaches also at DAX as we do. Um, mm -hmm. Great point on a variety of showings have the wow item, but for one, every wow item has six other normal samples. Yeah. Yeah. I but I always say right. the wow item proves your capacity and capability. Oh, sure. But if you have the other samples, it helps people visualize what they actually want. The, why, the wow item says to somebody, yes, this person is creative and can do something amazing. And that might help them trust you to do the normal job, um, which right. there is a reason for the wow items, though. I'm going to say something that I do. This is what I do always on the take up. I, I jump in and go, OK, are there any customers in the room? Just let's wait till all the customers are gone. Okay. Uh, customers have no vision. 85% of them have no idea what they really want and they can have no idea how to tell you what they want. And so if you don't put samples up and show people stuff, they'll have no idea what, what's going on. They don't know. And that's not bad, but people on the whole, we who are creative people, generally you're in this industry creative, you have these ideas, you think you know what you want and you expect other people to come to you with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Our customers don't always have that and they don't have the vision to tell. And they also very much don't know our medium. They don't know embroidery. Right. They don't know print. They don't know sublimation, what it can do. They only know what they want. And, and honestly, a lot of the time what it is, is actually like we talked about before it's result. It's like, I want when my people show up from my, you know, landscaping company that they look professional and clean and that this shirt washes nicely mm -hmm. and it's got my name on it so that they can identify the guy at the door. Um, that's, that's what they want pretty frequently. Well, and I think the other thing you need to remember about the wow samples, which I like that and I'm going to steal it just so everybody knows, um, <laughs> is that they also show off that you've done your due diligence and you've done your yes. training and you put your time in and you can, you can create the big elaborate things and you know how to do that, which means yeah. you've learned about how thread interacts with material or you know, how to sublimate a hard good and do it well and yeah. do it with the contours and all the stuff that happens with that. And I don't know what the hand thing is, but I'm really into it right now, apparently. <laughs> um, so that's, there's a purpose to the wow, but yes. I think he's right. You need to have the basics too, because the basics are probably where most of your money is going to come from. The wow is the stuff that's going to get you accolades and you need both. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, that's, that makes a lot of sense. It, Kelly, now Kelly has a different 
market, but because as you know, uh, doing all of the crystal work that she yeah, does, she wow. does really high end work. Wow. Yeah, but she says we love doing the wow and then post the customer DIY the normal. For her, absolutely. If you were doing that kind of work, it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, I can I can see that you don't have pricing to make it worth the bother. That's the line I'm going to steal out of this. Go ahead and do the art project. Price oh, yeah. it accordingly. Price it accordingly. Yeah. And then actually, I'll bring in something from Brian that's maybe a little more affable to everybody. Uh, one thing I've never seen when buying embroidery is a comparison between the original logo and the interpreted embroidery result. I wonder if that would help or hinder, uh, but I think it might be useful and there's need to explain it. I actually did use that quite a, quite a lot. Um, there are times I see digitizing companies do it where they will show you uh, the logo and the interpretation because they're trying to show you the skill in the interpretation. I certainly have done it myself, mm -hmm. but I'll admit that usually I was waiting for a the client to hit an impasse or if not an impasse to hit a design where the level of the design means I'm going to have to make changes. Right. Then I would often show them what that interpretation was, or if they were really um, slavish and not letting me make any changes to the interpretation, I would show them what the differences were uh, usually that way. I think mm -hmm. sometimes people will come in and when you tell them I'm going to change your logo, they get upset because they feel like you're going to change the thing that belongs to me. That is my brand. And I don't want it changed. What you have to say is I'm going to make the best embroidered interpretation of your logo that I can, right. that serves the needs of the embroidery. That's a different thing altogether, even though it's all the same what you're going to do. So, I mean, really that is, ah, that is one of the things you have to do. I think that's really how it goes. Um, but that's, you know, oh, by the way, here's another thing from Mike who has a good point here. Uh, my low dollar, simple lips, left chesty type stuff sells on paper. My high end creative pieces sell by making a sample to touch and hold. Yeah. The real sample is a big deal. Um, Certainly, I, I'm not doing those on spec necessarily. I'm not saying go do them on spec um, unless you really have a good reason. Now, I'll admit, have I done spec? Absolutely. If I'm going in to pitch a you know multi million dollar uh, chain of hospitals on garments, I'm going in with their logo digitized, embroidered on a sample. I'm not going to walk in with paper on that if I think I'm going to tie down their entire uniforming. And how do I know? Because I've done it twice and, and secured them. Um, but you secure those jobs by doing that because people people have to feel, touch, see to trust your quality when they're, especially when you're at that level where you've got a committee who's passing around a garment mm -hmm. to decide if you're going to be their company store. That does make a difference. So yeah, Ooh, for definitely. sure. Though definitely. I will agree with that. Uh, here's something that does really happen. Um, you often don't get what you really need from people. Todd says, I need your logo in vector format. Here's my business card. Yep. That's, oh, uh, I'm finding that right now with a customer where I've explained yep. it to her like five different times what Vector is, what we need, why we don't think she wants to do sublimated patches, which Nmart sells, mm -hmm. which great. I'll do, we'll do those all day. Not a problem. But she won't get what I keep telling her. This lettering's too small. The size you want's too small. It's not going to work. I'm sorry. It's just, it's not going to turn out in a way that we're going to be proud to do it and you're going to be proud to have it. So, you know, if you can get us some vector art, we can take a look at it and see what we can do. She won't understand what vector art is. I can't yeah. make her. I'm trying, but I can't make her. I know there are some people that don't, the education doesn't work. Oh, by the way, it looks like Katie is okay with you stealing her, her wow, her wow version. <laughs> well, awesome. I take you. you're, you're a pal. I appreciate it. Katie, you can feel free. We keep trading. As Terry says, the first time I give you credit, the second time I said it first. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. He just says he doesn't take credit or he doesn't give you credit the second time. But yeah, no, that is very, very true. Uh, and also, I love this. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I love hearing this. I tried the best embroidery I can the other day, blew my customer away. Oh, well, awesome. good. Awesome. Like Nida that's says, awesome. it's not what you say, but how you say it. It's yep. a very good portion, portion of that. Um, Very true. And Kelly, and I'm sure Kelly knows this because I, I have done the simplest of rhinestone work and it takes a lot of shuffling and messing around mm -hmm. to do custom corporate stuff in, in rhinestones because once again, like thread, you have a known measurement mm -hmm. of how big a unit is that you have to work with. Um, so that's definitely one of those things. Yeah, interpretation right. using the medium you have. But Carolyn, this is a good point also. My wow stuff is for me. It's my way to create art. I do what I want. Yeah. Self-guided design projects give you a chance to do some of that wow stuff and do it any way you want and make it the best embroidery it can be. And then you can still have that as a uh, sample. Well, and Carolyn, I think, has also carved out a niche for doing yes. that kind of stuff. And she also yes. charges accordingly for doing that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I admire i still want to wear the bee dress at some point even though yellow is so not my color but it's a gorgeous 
piece of work. She needs to find a purple dress and put embroidery on it. That's what we need. Yes. And by the way, Carolyn's working on a piece. It's got one of my designs on it and I'm already like champing at the bit. I want to share everybody. That oh, very it. So cool. I, she has done some really, really cool stuff. Uh, oh yeah. I keep sending her stuff and go, eh, try this, play with this, do this. So no, absolutely. And I, I will say that Arlette, who once again, digitizing for a good long time, like I have been and has done a lot of great work. So I like selling my interpretation of the client's logo saying embroidery is a beautiful and unique artistic form. Let's talk about will work and won't work to give you the best rendition. 100%. That yeah. is the way that is done That's from a professional. You Thank you, Arlette. Perfect. Definitely. So yeah, this is, this is great guys. So, oh, and Thanks for this podcast, you guys. A breath of fresh air. Thank you, Sandy Joe. Yay, thank, you. Well, thank you all the ladies from uh, Women in Garment Decoration who are joining us. I appreciate yes. you all very, very much. And if you're female and you're not a member, I'm making a, a, a total plug right now. You should join us because yes. it's worth it. And how about this? I'm not in there because I can't be, and that's the right thing to do. <laughs> and I say go check it out because I keep hearing great things. I don't have to be there to well, know that they're running a good ship over there. Thank you. And I do have to say, <laughs> one of the things I'm thinking about is I had this idea today of for the next um, women in garment or women in the industry podcast, I think it would be kind of interesting to do a mixed podcast with women and men and talk about how women and men deal with crisis differently. That would be cool. You heard it here first, guys. Cool. And by the way, we I have. I, um... I haven't suggested that to Eric. That That's all right, because we have Aaron and uh, Terry here. Aaron has already asked me if I can digitize two other guys' logo. Let me tell you what. I have digitized some weird stuff in my life. Chicken wing won't even get close. Uh, I'll tell you the one that I always tell everybody else for stories. Uh, I had a bowling team that was called the Sloppy Joes, and oh, I had I to both – yeah, I've, I've showed this years ago. I'll have to find it again. I had to both draw and digitize an angry sandwich chasing a bowling pin. So an angry sandwich with mean eyes chasing a bowling pin. Uh, yeah, the chicken wing is not making me afraid. So yes, more two other guys uh, swag for sure. Um, and then definitely we have some other people talking about that. We've got Terry Combs just saying, hey, more two regular guys in the house. Yes, two regular guys are right here. So Thanks for Check watching. Check them that. out on Friday morning, everybody. We will be there. Brian, yeah. of course, thought I smelled chicken wings. Yep, you can tell they're here. Uh, though the fight for them is, if you want to bring it up, blue cheese or ranch, and I'll start that fight now so they can start fighting in the comments over oh, blue cheese or ranch. Oh, no, no. Don't even go there. <laughs> well, let's see what else we have. This is, we talked about Vector. I'm going to bring this up. Uh, Timothy says, uh, if you can't get Vector from them, do you just do it or continue the discussion? I feel like some walk when that discussion happens, either the next person will say the same. Uh, for me, depends on the client, what they're trying to order, because I would often redraw or build it into my costs for digitizing and do a redraw so that I had clean art. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on digitizing. You don't need to start from vector. I have literally digitized from a cocktail napkin sketch. That is not a joke. That is mm -hmm. literally ballpoint on cocktail napkin. I've done it. Um, but so, because I redraw everything, I don't use vector in my, in my digitizing, but you, you often need to redraw, especially if you're trying to have, you know, coordinating pieces or print that's involved. And I would sell that as a service and say, Hey, you don't have vector. Totally fine here's what a redraw costs, or I'll hire out the redraw and just pass the cost directly to them and not do any add on. It yep. just means that I have a better source to work from and they have their art next time. And I make sure that they have exactly what they need the next time they're working with it. So it just depends on how you want to do it. I will say fighting with someone who doesn't know what it is for extended period of time, not very helpful. No. Well, and how we do it, um, sublimated patches, we have a design department. I'm lucky that way. Mm. So everything goes through them. The co there is no artwork cost when you buy sublimated patches unless we have to redraw, in which case I will quote you a price and tell you why we're doing it. Yeah. And we go from there. We, you know, we will sometimes run a sample if we're very concerned about how things are going to work because, you know, a lot of people don't understand it's sublimation. Yes, it's photorealistic. But if you're doing a two inch patch and your letters are this big, they're not going to show up. You're not going to be yeah. able to read it. So, you know, but, but as for chasing people with Vector, this one woman that I'm dealing with now, she's yeah. local and she's a very sweet lady and I'm trying to help her. Normally, no, I don't have the time to do it. Well, but, like I said, we all break our own rules depending. Like I can well, tell you yeah. don't do it. Yeah. 
But if you're gonna, if I'm gonna tell you, have I ever done it? Yeah, sure. I, I've fought well, with a sign company who I knew had it. Yeah, no, that's my big one. I, I remember sign companies who didn't want to release the vector, and I'm like, I'm not gonna make a sign, and I'm going to edit it immediately. Please just let me have the vector this person paid for. Mm -hmm. I have fought over vector that I shouldn't have. I just know that I spent time I didn't need to. I want to bring in this comment from Jeff because I think this is especially right now very very uh, pertinent. Um, some advice I took from my sister, but don't tell her. <laughs> that you need to do something for 30 minutes a day that makes you happy. It's where most of my creative stuff comes out and it rejuvenates me for the rest of the day. Yeah, take time and play. Taking time to play is a big deal and you really learn quite a lot. Uh, also, I want to see <laughs> here Aaron brings in. I look like we're looking at the future two other guys here. You never know. Could happen, folks. Could happen. Okay, do we understand that I'm not a guy? I mean, I'm honored to be an honorary to regular guy, I guess, but not a guy. Though he did redeem himself by plugging directly oh, women in garment did. decoration. So go to that link and check it out if you are a woman in garment decoration. That's very sweet of you. I appreciate it. And Ramona says it's a great group and supportive. Aaron's eating ranch dressing right now. The fight goes on. Well, I'm drinking out of my huge two regular guys tumbler, which when I drink, you can't see my face. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I actually, once again, made by uh, Aaron himself as well. I have my uh, Eric emoji. Oh, I, I shared this embroidered emoji at one point and uh, he put that up and, and made this. I, I did not expect it whatsoever. But since then, I've had some requests. Jeff just requested again a moment ago uh, that he wants a sticker. Why you want an Eric head sticker anywhere near you, I don't know. But yeah. we'll, we'll see. Well, there's the chicken wing. Whoops. There's, 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 there's the chicken it. wing. There's chicken wing with the microphone. So there you go. Yes, we indeed. have represented the two regular guys here. About, by the way, yes, charge them for the vector. Don't give it to them unless they pay the lease fee. That's certainly a way to handle it. That's that's there. Um, and let's see, something from Todd. We get we at some point could be talked about uh, spouses working together. Uh, I, I have at one point worked with my spouse. Uh, it is uh, entertaining to say the least because you find that people start to split you up and see if they can get pressure on either of you by asking the other for stuff. So you get coworkers who treat you like the mom and dad in a traditional like stereotype household where it's like, ask your mother that didn't work. Okay. Go ask dad and see if he's more permissive. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. that happens. That happens. Working with friends well, can happen. I have to say, I, I've never had a spouse. So, and mm -hmm. I've never worked with a boyfriend or anything. Thank God. Cause I had really bad taste in men for a while there, but anyway, um, but I currently work for a family owned company and the husband yes. and wife both work at the company. And that's interesting sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. But it's, it's, um, I mean, they're actually yeah. pretty good, but every once in a while, a little friction client gets in there and it, uh, you know, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> Here's here's what I'm going to say on that topic because family business is a thing. I worked for a family business also. Uh, this is the one thing I have seen family business businesses suffer from, is that family dynamics spill into the business, mm -hmm. or you start as a family business where everybody's on the same page, you're working towards a common goal because you're all family, and as you add people to it, you don't kind of revamp the way you work. And so right. you end up working like a family, small business forever and not implementing tools you need to when not everyone's on the same page. I mean, right. you don't implement those tools because you expect everyone's working for the cause when you may not have that common cause with all of your employees. Now, you should be building that as a company, but it's not the right. same common cause of let's make sure that, you know, Pop Pop and Gammy get down to the family reunion. Well, your third line guy who's doing packaging could give a damn about Pop Pop and Gammy and how they're getting to how they're getting down to the beach. So that's just one of those things I've seen in consulting with people is sometimes doesn't work out that way. But you know, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, the the daughter of the family runs our New Jersey plant. The sister is our HR, and then the president and VP are. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, oh, no, <laughs> and there's, definitely I mean, there's a lot of good in that, but there's also times where it's like, this is a little weird. <laughs> Whereas not everybody has bad experiences. We have a uh, Heidi says, I love working with my spouse. It's how we met. That's awesome. Well, and I, I mean, awesome. there are a lot of people that probably could work very well with their spouse and be fine with it. I, like I said, never had one that, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I'll say, honestly, it, it's because I also have had the pleasure of working with friends. And sometimes that can be hard, too, because you'll find that uh, when there's friends or anyone you have a relationship with, that's yeah. whatever it is outside of work, um, there will be bruised feelings at some point. 
Mm -hmm. you will have a time where you're fighting over something, but you're not really fighting over the thing you think you're fighting about. Uh, just well, and I think there's different expectations sure. when you're working with family or friends yeah. than there is when you're just working in a, just a coworker relationship. And that's, you know, that can be a good thing because I think you trust your friends a little more maybe, but it also can bring in a lot of elements, like you said, that have nothing to do with the work you're trying to do. So. Uh, and it happens to all of us, myself included. So this is not like I was standing above the line and not doing that. Oh, no. Everyone else. No. no, everyone has a bad day. Everyone says something that's about your family life or something else. Uh, it can be wrong. Yeah. So that's true. So here's Terry's solution to that. Uh, my husband has his own business and I have mine. We work in the same two-story building. He's downstairs and upstairs. Keeps the homicide rate down. Yeah. There you go. Sometimes a little separation doesn't, doesn't hurt anything. But let me go with one last question. I think that we're getting up toward the end. So any last we are. comments, guys, we're going to have a hard out at, at an hour because um, we're going to go ahead and leave some room for someone who's coming up shortly. Our success group, speaking of uh, Aaron Montgomery and Todd Downing, they've got a, an education thing going on after us. And there's a little buffer in between there I know some of you guys are cross-pollinating from those two groups. We're going to leave some room for you guys there. But let's bring in Jeff's question here. Um, personal experience question. Uh, do you ever research the brands that bring you work when they seek generic merchandise? If I understand that, are you? if you're talking about blanks, blank merchandise, as a decorator, I was never very comfortable selling blanks because usually uh, if there's going to be someone that's trying to scam you, they're trying to buy blanks from you en masse. Uh, that is usually a scam. And so I was not someone who sold blanks. We did decoration and that's what we did. So I'll just answer that directly and say, you know, that's. Well, we sell supplies, so there's no way I could research everybody. If they were kinky, I do. Yes. Um, but otherwise, no, because that's what we do. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I, I think that's, you know what, honestly, the watchword always is just kind of, you know, keep your wits about you. You'll feel when something is wrong. If it's right. a little too easy, if the design seems weird, if somebody wants a cases and cases of blanks, uh, yeah, don't do that. And also, um, there are people who are going to run with stuff. I'm going to say this. This is a, this is a tangent, a brief tangent. Um, people always ask me whether or not I let uh, customers have their import, their digitizing files or the digitized files. And what I'll say for me, I always did. I would give them a bare file without a bunch of information. Um, unless they wanted to pay for a package where I'd put together the thread colors and samples and everything. And I would give them a package that was like a branding patch package mm -hmm. and that was charged for, but if you just wanted your DST file, no info, I would hand that over. And the reason being is if someone is a bargain shopper, who's just looking for one order and then they're going to go to the next person who's five cents less per garment, number one, they're not your best client. Number two, they're going to hate you forever and bad mouth you if you try and hold them hostage by holding onto their file. Give them their file, let them go, be cordial when you do it and say, if you want to come back, if you don't like how the other shop treats you, I'll be here. But the truth of the matter is um, most of the people who I did that to came back later because they were really just shopping around. And when they didn't like what they got somewhere else, they would come back. Um, but otherwise, if they did leave and leave forever, most of the time, that's somebody who is going to be you know, constantly hammering you for 10 more percent off anyway, because that's what they usually yeah. do to me. And if someone tells me I can get it cheaper somewhere else, I didn't say this in my head. What I thought is I have customers that pay more, number one. Number two, the one time I ever really did he get heated about it, I had to, one time I got absolutely really heated. I told the person when they, when they close their doors in six months because they're not charging enough, you're welcome to come back. <laughs> and in about nine months, they came back and they told me no lie, went to the shop, their doors were closed and I can't get a hold of anybody and they have my garments and all my stuff. So uh -oh. that actually happened in the real world once and I felt vindicated for that slight moment. But yeah, it, well, there you go. bargain shoppers aren't your best customers. So yeah, be careful about that. And and like uh, here Alexa says, anytime someone knows exactly what they want, t your blank wise is usually a scam. How many clients come in knowing exactly what that brand sizing, you know, Very true. Like the number. Yeah, true. Very true. true. So, Christine, we are about to head out. Do you have yeah. any last, like words of wisdom you want to leave anybody with or uh, things you want to tell them in these trying times? Words of wisdom. Um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to throw out what I said in a post that I wrote in the group the other day, which is right now, more than ever, everybody needs to be a light and a hope in the world because there's a lot of bad, scary stuff going on right now. And a lot of people are uncertain. So, put positivity out there, put good out there, do what you can to support and love and help your fellow man. And yes, I sound like a 
I don't know what I sound like a guru of some kind, but that's really what I feel is important right now. So there you go. Words of wisdom from me for today. Those are awesome words of wisdom. And I'll leave with a thing that I almost always leave any of my presentations on, which is to say, uh, dream big, stay bold, yep. go out there and keep doing what you do. And I know I'll tell you the truth of the matter is sometimes I, I get to where I'll start feeling despair. And what I realize is I can either decide to live in that despair while things are going on, or I can decide to live the way I want to live, despite the fact that they are going on. We're not, I'm not saying hide your head in the sand. What I'm saying is do your best, help people as best you can. Do also take care of yourselves and keep dreaming and keep trying and keep doing the things you want to do, because these are the precious hours of your life and they don't come back. So it's worthwhile to live them the way you want to live them. Yep. Look for the helpers, Mr. Rogers says. Absolutely. Well, and I consider all of you guys showing up to be. Yeah, thank awesome. you so much. And it's great for us. And you guys have been the helpers for us too, by being part mm -hmm. of the conversation. So with that, uh, this wonderful experiment, this uh, Ask the Expert. Yeah, and our heart out was over about 30 seconds ago. So. <laughs> it's over. We got to go, guys. Happy to have you guys here and thank you all for being here. Thank you.